If you're older than eight years old, you've probably seen the word subnet mask someplace, and you might think that you have some basic understanding of what that means. You might think that it's some subdivision of the internet that you've been assigned, or some way of making it more wholesome to consume the internet pieces or fragments, or you might think that it ha it's something to do with exhaustion of the internet numbers. I'm sick and tired of people not understanding it, so let's go into this. Let's talk about subnetting. Everyone should really know more about subnets because the internet is like a daily part of our lives and everyone is multi-homed. Everyone is connected to a home network, Wi-Fi, your phone is multi-homed. Jesus fucking Christ, it's 2017 and everyone has a cell phone and it's multi-homed. Think about that. I remember when only fucking crazy geeks had multi-homed internet when you had multiple different networks you could connect to. Now everyone has a Wi-Fi, a 4G, a landline of some sort, a cable, a DSL, something. Not only that, your car might have its own Wi-Fi, you might have MiFi's in range, you might be on some guest network. Jesus Christ. Ask yourself this, if you think you know what a subnet is, what is the subnet mask on your computer, and what happens if you were to change it slightly? What, what is that number? Why does that number have to be accurate? What is that? If you ask someone what a subnet is and they start going into class A and class B and class C, you might as well just punch them in the face because they're an asshole. Because classful networking and classful routing hasn't been a thing since the 1990s and they just don't understand what the fuck they're talking about or why they're calling it that. Let's make this simple. A subnet is a general term to describe a range of addresses. That's it. The first thing that's helpful to realize is that IP addresses are just a number. They're just a single number. I know humans write IPv4 addresses as four numbers separated by dots, and v6 addresses as a bunch of numbers and letters with colons and shit, but in reality that's just ways for us to write them so that we don't fuck them up. They're really just really big numbers. They start at zero, and they go all the way up to all apps hexadecimals. Any IP address you can think of has a numeric form that is just like this, and in the description is a link to a website that you can use to convert these numbers. But that's it. IP addresses are just the number. They're just numbers in a big, long range. So when we talk about subnets, it's helpful to think about the range game from The Price is Right. So the range game is like there's this big range of prices and you stop the slider at some point when you think that the price of the item is within that, that, that slider. And all that a subnet does is it describes a size, a chunk of that range. It describes a starting point and a size, and that's all a subnet is. What you do with a subnet is completely up to you. Subnets are used to make routing decisions, they're used to make access decisions. It's helpful for humans to think about the size in terms of a range, like 192.168.1.0 through 255. But for computers, it's more helpful for it to think about the size as a bit field, as a mask of bits that determine whether or not an IP address is within that network or outside of that network. So my home network is a slash 24. In other words, the first 24 bits of an IP address are always the same as the network address 192.168.1.0. The rest of the bits, so in an IPv4 address, that's eight remaining bits. Those determine whatever unique IP address I want to give to that computer within that network. So for this reason, the most common way to represent this subnet is as the network address 192.168.1.0, a slash, and the number of bits that correspond with that network address, 24. The smaller the number of bits, the larger the network is. So a slash 23 has twice as many computers as a slash 24 because there's one extra bit that you can use in the address, which gives you twice as many possibilities. A slash 22 is twice as big as that. A slash 21 is twice as big as that. So it's important to understand that this is called slash notation or CIDR notation. It's the number of bits that make that network address unique. But there's also mask notation, and that's what you see on your computer when you see subnet mask. It's basically an IP address and a pseudo address made up of that mask, of that one. So if I have a slash 24, the first three bytes are all ones. The first 24 bits are all ones. So that winds up with 255.255.255.255. .255 .255 .255. 
.255.255, and then the finally, the last byte is all zeros, because that's where I drew the line, so zero. And it's a little bit easier to visualize, because you can represent both the network address and the mask in the same length, and you can just kind of do the, the number arithmetic. So if I take a local address, like my printer on my network, and I end it with my subnet mask, I'll line up with a number. And if this number is the same as my network address, then that printer is on my network. That device is on my network. If I take a different address, let's say Google, and I end it with my subnet mask, and I wind up with a number that is not my subnet mask, then that is not on my local network. And that's how a subnet either matches an address or it doesn't match an address. Either that address is in that subnet or it's not. And that's why it's more helpful for computers to represent it like bits, because then it can do this AND operation. But masks are kind of unintuitive, because if you have like a slash 25 where the line is like in the middle of a number, it, it the subnet mask is 255.255.128, and it's not immediately obvious that that means the first three chunks of the address and then one bit of this last number. So when you think of it as just a flat range of numbers and you use the, the, the bits, it, you can visualize it a little bit better. Now that we know that a subnet is just a chunk of IP space, why? Why do we use them? Why are they used? What is the fucking subnet mask on my computer for, and what if it's wrong? routing decisions. Subnets are primarily used for routing decisions and access decisions. Every time your computer or a router or anything on the network has to send a packet, it has to make a routing decision as to where it's going to go. Every device in an IP-based network has what's called a routing table, and the routing table is used to determine where and how to send traffic. That's it. So on your typical home network, you probably have a couple computers, your smartphone's using your Wi-Fi, you might have a printer, and then you have a router that's connected to your internet, whether it's cable, DSL, whatever, whatever you're using, satellite, whatever. So your local computer, if you're gonna print to your printer, when it sends packets, it, it, it needs to know not to send those out the router. It needs to send those to the MAC address of the printer and not the MAC address of the router. But likewise, your computer could be sending to a whole bunch of unknown addresses, like the IP address of eBay. You don't know the MAC address of eBay. There's no MAC address of eBay. That has to go through your router. That's not going to anything on your local network. So you need to be able to tell the difference between local and routable traffic. An interface is a place where a device connects to a network. Your computer probably has three or four interfaces. It has a loopback interface so it can talk to programs on the same computer. It probably has an interface for your Wi-Fi, one for your LAN. But on top of that, each interface might have different destinations. So on your home network, out your LAN, you might be able to send traffic to a printer that's on your local network. You might be able to send traffic to another computer. Or you might be able to send traffic through your router to anything on the internet. Your computer needs to know the MAC address of the next device it's going to send the traffic to. Because in order for your IP packet to be sent on your Ethernet network, you need a MAC address. So every interface has three pieces of information it generally wants. It needs to know its IP address. Without knowing its own IP address, it can't know what traffic is for it and what's not for it. So it needs to know its IP address. You just can't receive traffic without an IP address. It's very hard to send traffic without an IP address too. But it's possible, that's how DHCP works. Now having a single IP address with no default gateway, this will allow you to talk to other computers in the same broadcast domain. Now what do I mean when I say broadcast domain? When I say broadcast domain, I mean when you send a broadcast packet, what can hear that? Depending on whether you're connected to a switch, whether you're connected to a hub, whatever you're connected to, that determines what all you can send to without having to go through a router. In your local network, you can send to anything on your Wi-Fi, and you can send anything on your wired network without having to go through a router, so that's your broadcast domain. If you start spraying broadcast packets onto your network, these devices can hear you. And that's important because that's how ARP works. Without a router and without a routing table, ARP allows you to say, hey, I want to send to this IP address. Who has that? So you say, I want to send, I'm going to ping 192.168.1.10. Who has 192.168.1.10? And if some computer on your network or router or printer has that, it'll send an ARP reply and it'll say, I have that. And because it's sending a frame on your network, you now know its MAC address, and now you know how to send traffic to just that device without spraying broadcast packets all over the place. So with the single IP address, you can talk to stuff on your local network. It's only when you want to talk to things beyond that that you got to start making hard-hitting routing decisions, goddammit. 
And for that, you're gonna at least need a default gateway. The default gateway is gonna be where you're sending the shit that you can't talk to locally. And this generally represents the IP address of your router or firewall or whatever is gonna be forwarding your traffic on to some other network that's beyond what you can talk to. And the last thing that your computer will need if it's going to use the default gateway is the subnet mask. And the subnet mask determines what gets sent through the default gateway versus traffic on your local network, traffic going to your printer, your mom, the local router itself, etc. So if your subnet mask is incorrect, you're either going to be sending traffic meant for local computers out to your internet router incorrectly, or more likely you're going to be sending traffic meant for the internet locally trying to resolve it using ARP, which is just going to result in some timeout, and that's how you're going to get this destination host unreachable. So let's look at it from your home out. Your home computer is very straightforward. It probably is only connected to one or two networks. It can very easily determine whether it's going to use a network connection or send to something else on itself. It says, okay, I want to talk to Google, so I'm going to go through either the LAN adapter, the Wi-Fi adapter, you know, this adapter, whatever, and I'm going to use my default gateway, so I'm going to send to that MAC address. And then it gets to your home router, and your home router has, you know, a little bit more of a complicated decision. Is this on my local network, this 192.168.1.0 thing, or is this someplace else? And the same thing, you can use the default gateway, which is a router that my ISP provided, presumably through DHCP or Slack, whatever. So when it gets to your ISP's router, then your ISP's router goes, okay, well, is this, you know, other customer traffic that has to go out one of these other cable modems, or do I go up? one level to my provider. And eventually it's going to reach some provider router where there's more than one direction to go to, more than one ISP. And that's where BGP and OSPF come into play. And we're not going to go into that, but your ISP's router has to make decisions it has to make. They may have one uplink, they may have multiple uplinks, they may send traffic this way during the day, it might be cheaper to send it this way at night, but whatever. That's configured by them and, and there's routing decisions there. Each one of those routing decisions is represented by a routing entry, which is using a subnet, a, a network address and a size to determine how big that rule applies to. And it goes through a series of routing decisions to figure out, you know, which direction it goes to. There's a metric associated with each one that determines what order it gets evaluated in. That way it can do, you know, highest preference routing and maybe failback routing. And this is how redundancies in the internet work. You know, go this direction. If that direction is down, then use this ISP. We'll be able to deliver the traffic if the first one's down. And at some point you're going to wind up at a router that knows about every direction. You're going to wind up with a router that has no default gateway. It has no up uplink to an unknown network. And that is called a backbone router. That is a router that knows, given any IP address, whether it's going to go in one direction or it's going to drop it. But there is no default gateway when you get to that point. And that is how everything goes up. Up the chain. Up. And when we talk about going down, coming back in towards your computer, we talk about delegation. And subnets are used in reselling the internet. And they're critical in how ISPs get chunks of address space from Aaron or the regional distributors for IP space in different countries and, and how they resell it. And it's how your ISP resells space to you. Okay, so how it works is that I can. The I can group can help. No, not the Billy Mays Insurance Company. I'm talking about the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They dictate which range of the internet address space each country gets. And then an organization within that country, so for America, it's Aaron, they then carve out that address space into various ways, whether they use registrars or they directly sell it to ISPs, whether they sell it to customers, whatever. So for example, America might get entire slash eights. In the IPv4 world, slash eights are really big. In the IPv6 world, they're even bigger. But slash eights are like gigantic building blocks of the internet, you know, like 10 dots, 8 dots, 6 dots. Um, an entire organization is unlikely to have this much address space unless they're Google or Amazon. But a reseller will probably own this space and then they'll resell it. They'll resell a smaller section. They'll resell a slash 16 or a slash 20 or a slash 21 to a specific ISP and then the ISP will carve it out. They'll carve out set, they'll carve out subnets that make sense for them. Comcast will carve it out based on areas, based on head ends, based on wherever they're coming back to. DSL companies will carve it out based on DSLAMs. 
and then your ISP carves out a chunk for you. On V6, your ISP is probably going to give you a slash 48 or a slash 64. And on V4, you're probably just going to get a slash 32, which is a single address. And that's why you have to use NAT to turn your internal addresses into external addresses on V4. But on V6, your internal addresses go all the way out, and you can easily see that that's not part of the routing algorithm. Routing is not all about NAT, it's about directions. So now that we know that the internet is made up of routers that have to make routing decisions based on routing tables, it's important to understand the history of CIDR. CIDR stands for Classless Interdomain Routing, and to understand at all why it's important, we have to understand how routing used to work. Back before the 90s, IP addresses had a very specific format. The first couple bits of the IP address determine the class of the address. And this is what used to be used to determine subnet size. There's a number of different classes, but general purpose addresses either fall into class A, class B, or class C. So what this means is that in the olden days, if an IP address began with anything from 1 to 126, it was class A, or a slash 8 subnet. Anything from 128 to 191 was a class B address, or a slash 16. And anything from 192 to 223 wound up being a slash 24. Now this is ridiculous, because a slash 8 network could literally, in order for a slash a network to be of use to anyone, you'd have to have thousands of devices on the same broadcast domain, which is completely impossible. It doesn't make any sense. So yes, classful routing was an inefficient use of address space, but this was not the problem. We didn't invent insider because we were running out of medium and small size networks, even though we would have. We could have just used larger networks and just put less things on them. That's not the problem. The problem is routing tables and routers. As the internet grew, routing tables grew, and it was unscalable. There was no way to basically say, hey, this whole chunk of the internet goes in this direction, or this whole chunk of address space goes in this direction. The sizing was done based on the numbers, and the numbers were done based on allocations being done by humans and organizations. It wasn't being done logically. And this is where CIDR comes in. You can now say, hey, this whole chunk of the network goes this way. And you can do things called supernetting. So for example, if I have these routing entries, and they all go to the same destinations, I can make an aggregate or a supernet of those networks and basically describe them with one number, because they're all adjacent. If I have multiple adjacent networks that I can describe with a larger chunk, then I can do that, and it's called route aggregation. And it's why contiguous address space can be represented by a single routing entry, no matter how many people own it, and no matter how it's resold. And it's why routers don't have to know about the entire internet, or even all of what they're talking to. And that's a big win, because the faster you can route traffic, the faster traffic can go through the internet. CIDR is also good for sales, because it means that you can break things into tiny chunks. Before, the smallest size network you could sell was a Class C, and you had to have special routers, or basically per address routing in order to break it into smaller chunks. But now, you can break it into anything smaller, slash 25, a 26, 27, you can go all the way down to a slash 30, which has two addresses in it. Two addresses. You can go to slash 32, which is one address, but that's per address routing. Subnets are used in other places. They're used in firewall rules. They're used in ban lists for chats. They're used in a number of different things. They're used anytime we need to represent a chunk of address space. And the last thing that I want to say about subnets is that a lot of times people confuse the layer two and layer three aspects of things. Subnets are just numbers. They're logical numbers that are used to represent human-made routing decisions. They don't have anything to do with physical network topology. A VLAN or a LAN is the actual entity where you can send traffic. If you can directly send a packet to another computer, it's on the same LAN as you. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same subnet. I can have computers in both of these subnets independently talking to each other over the same switch, over the same VLAN or LAN. Likewise, if you have the right routing technology, a subnet can span multiple VLANs. This is a, v a VPN is a great example. A, a subnet of VPN space spans not only the ports on you know a switch, but it, it reaches into people's homes. So don't confuse a subnet and a LAN or a VLAN. A LAN or a VLAN represents a contiguous piece of broadcast domain. A subnet is a grouping of computers used for routing decisions. A lot of times you have one subnet per VLAN. In fact, most times you have one subnet per VLAN. But that doesn't mean that the computers on that VLAN aren't talking on different subnets amongst themselves with different routing technologies, different protocols, all kinds of other stuff. So, you know, think about it. 
I don't know if any of that makes any sense, but hopefully it does. 